we've been working our way through the uh, Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. And last week, we finished with verse 21. We saw how when the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people removed and stood afar off. They were afraid, but Moses, although the people stood afar off, verse 21, Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. Now, the Ten Commandments had just been given. The Lord had come down out of heaven, settled upon the mount, and, and spoke the Ten Commandments forth, the moral law, for the people to hear. The people were afraid. They ran. They fled. But Moses drew near. And I thought it was interesting. It says, Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. He drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. I was thinking about the contrast between that right there and 2 Corinthians chapter 4. As, as you read through the scriptures, I mean, we're, we're in the beginning. We're looking at Genesis. We're looking at Exodus. But as born-again Christians, we've looked at the Gospels. We've, we've looked at John. We've looked later on in the scriptures. And we've looked at Hebrews. And the Hebrews is such a great book that Paul the Apostle writes to the Hebrew people explaining the difference between the two testaments and how the first testament had a glory that faded away, but the second testament has a glory that's everlasting. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, he says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, have shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. We see the difference here between the New Testament in the person of Jesus Christ and the Old Testament and the Ten Commandments. There was a thick darkness. The Ten Commandments bring a cloud between God and us. That's what happens. I mean, there's Almighty, Holy God, and then there's sinful man. And what separates God from men, God lays these Ten Commandments down in the midst to show us that we're not right in His sight. And those Ten Commandments do not bring us close to God. If anything, they put a cloud between us and God. It's only in the person of Christ Jesus, in the face of Jesus Christ, do we get the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. It's great to be a New Testament Christian. It's great to have in Jesus is light. He is the true light, the light of men, and we get this light and relationship of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so I just noticed the difference there. Moses, the prophet, Moses, the lawgiver, what was his relationship like with God? Well, as long as those Ten Commandments there, there was a thick cloud. Moses' relationship with God was made wonderful when Jesus Christ came. And he saw Christ ahead of time in, in the eye of faith. And he also got to be with Jesus Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew chapter 17. Why don't you turn there? Matthew 17, 1, After six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. And we learn in the same uh, account in Luke chapter 9 that they were in their glory. And it was in the person of Jesus Christ before him that Moses had that clear look into the face of God. Moses never saw the face of God. We'll, we'll see this as we go through the Old Testament. He never got to look into the face of God. It was only in the light of the countenance of Jesus Christ. And so I noticed that difference right there in Exodus chapter 20 as the Ten Commandments are given. Even though Moses, his heart's desire is to draw near unto God, there's thick cloud and thick darkness where God was back where we were in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 21. I just wanted you to notice that difference and just reflect on how blessed we are to be in the New Testament and have Jesus Christ as our Savior to give us the light of the glory of God in his person and in his face.
Now notice what happens here in the end of this particular chapter. There's one last paragraph mentioned in Exodus chapter 20 before we get to the next chapter. In Exodus chapter 20, in verse 22, paragraph marking, And the Lord said unto Moses, I mean, Moses is trying to come close to God. He's hearing God through the thick darkness. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. Again, notice how the reiteration of the commandment against idolatry and false gods. This is a, a theme that will run throughout the scriptures. You see, the Lord God, the God of heaven, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, who is the Lord of all earth and Lord of all of heaven, that God does not want idolatry. That God will dwell in your heart by faith. And anyone that needs an image, whether it be a picture or whether it be a statue, has lost the relationship with God in their heart. When someone has God in their heart and sees God through the eye of faith in the heart, based on what God says, you don't need any statues. You don't need any images. You don't need any aids to worship. You have the Word of God, and you have the Word of faith, and that's how it's done. And God will reiterate this throughout the Scriptures. God mentioned it in the second commandment. God mentions it again here. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a Christian the other day about this and saying, well, you know, in the New Testament, there's not much mentioned about idolatry. And I said, well, you know, it's, it's funny. The apostle of love, the apostle that we all love, who's the apostle we love? What's well, John? The Gospel of John is the very book that God used to lead so many of us to salvation. It's that universal gospel that reaches throughout the world, whether you're Jew or Gentile, whether you're from you're Occidental or Oriental, God will use that particular gospel to reveal His Son to you. And in that particular writer gets to write five books in the New Testament. He is the Pentateuch author of the New Testament. You have Moses writing five books in the Old Testament. You have John writing five books in the New Testament. He writes the Gospel of John. He writes 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and the book of Revelation. He winds it up. God uses him to wind up the revelation of Jesus Christ. And when you read that first epistle toward the back of the Bible, the one that says God is love, the one that says God is light. The, the, the one that says, Behold, now are we the sons of God. What love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Notice how he ends that first epistle. Turn back to 1 John in the back of the Bible. And look at the last verse of that epistle. I mean, it's such a precious, precious epistle. Speaking about God's love. God is love. And there is no fear in love. Perfect love casteth out fear. Uh, we are the children of God. We love God. We keep His commandments. All through here, He's talking about the relationship, the precious fellowship we have with God the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. And He ends this epistle after telling you in the second last verse, the second last verse is 520, We know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God. Now notice that. He just told you Jesus Christ is the true God. That's what he says right there in that verse. Somebody wants to know who's the true God. There it is. There's the message of the New Testament. This is the true God. And eternal life. If you don't know that, if you have any other Jesus than Jesus as the second person of the Trinity, Jesus as the true God, Jesus who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, Philippians chapter 2, because he is God, he was God, always will be God, this is the true God, you don't have everlasting life if you don't see that. Talked with a Jehovah's Witness last week, we're talking in the middle of the week about it. He just cannot see Jesus Christ as God, so I had to explain to him, you are lost. You are in the watchtower in the wilderness, like it says in the book of Chronicles, where there's dead men's bodies and dead bones all around you. That's where you're headed. Jesus Christ is the true God. That's the message of the New Testament. And then notice how he ends this epistle. I would have ended with verse 20, but look, he throws in verse 21. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Amen. Because either you know the true God or you're an idolater. It's that simple in God's eyes. It's black or white with God. Either you know His Son, Jesus Christ, as God, and you've received Him as Savior, or you are an idolater. 
That's the divide written right there. And everyone that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is an idolater. No, I'm not. I'm an atheist. You're your own God. You're an idolater. You probably got pictures of yourself all over <laughs> and statues to yourself. And this is when I won this award, and this is at the one tennis match I play second, and this is, uh huh, you're an idolater. All right, go back to Exodus. I just want to show you, it's important. Old and New Testament. The heart of man hasn't changed, times have changed, but the heart is still deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Exodus chapter 20. So God reiterates in verse 23, Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall you make unto you gods of gold. Now notice, ye shall not make with me gods of silver. In other words, sometimes you say, okay, I'm not going to make a god, a, 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 an idol of God, but I'm going to make this other uh, uh, statue here, this other idol that has a relationship with God, and I'll pray to that, and that has a relationship with God. No, you don't make that with me. And then he says how you're going to worship, verse 24. Now I'm telling you how not to worship. Now let me show you how to worship, verse 24. God says, an altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen. In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of you in stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. Now he says, there's wrong way to worship me, there's a right way to worship me. The wrong way to worship me, God says, is to make idols of any kind. I don't want idols of me. I don't want idols of people that know me. I don't want idols of any kind. And not only this, I don't want you to make an altar of hewn stone. You're not to take your tools and start carving a fine, beautiful altar up there with ornate, elaborate workings where the finest gold and silver and ivory have been worked in there where people will come and say, wow, isn't that impressive? He says, when you do that, you've polluted mine altar. Folks, this is God. Are you reading your Bible? Mm -hmm. I'm not making this up. This is God right here telling them how to do it. Don't you put your tools on it. Now he's speaking to the people here. I know you want to get ahead of me, brother. We're going we're gonna to get there in chapter 25. But he's laying some ground rules down for basic worship right here. And I'll show you spiritually what they mean. Now he tells them not to do it this way. He says, Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. Now, let me get my glasses here. <laughs> now, when he talks about, about the nakedness, he explains a little bit more about this in the 28th chapter of this very book. So go to Exodus 28, just so that I can show you quickly. God is not expecting them to, to, to worship him in the nude. But God is going to define for them what he feels is a certain part of the body he doesn't want to see. And here's what he says in, in the 28th chapter of Exodus. He says in verse 40, For Aaron's sons, thou shalt make coats, thou shalt make for them girdles and bonnets, thou shalt make them for glory and beauty. Now, a girdle was something to gird the coat around here when they did the work so they wouldn't trip over it. Verse 41, Thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother and his sons with him, and shalt anoint them and consecrate them and sanctify them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. Verse 42, And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness from the loins even unto the thighs they shall reach. They shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons when they come in unto the tabernacle of the congregation or when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place that they bear not iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever unto him and his seed after him. God says, there's a certain part of the body I don't want to see. I don't want to see a man's body between the knees and his loins. And if I do, that's nakedness. Now what he says is, I don't want you to make an altar with steps. 
I don't want you to make an altar where these guys are coming up to me by steps. Because as they come up by steps, there's a chance I may see under them and see that nakedness. And if I do, they'll die. This is what the Lord says. They'll die. Now, now we're going to understand later on when we get in the book of Numbers, Nadab and Abihu are going to die for disobeying the Lord's commands. And these are members of the Aaronic high priest. And then later on, we'll see the breach of uh, Uzzah when God takes him out for handling the ark. And then we'll find that out later on in the books of Kings when we study that. God has a high accountability to those people that are his and know his word. God is not speaking to lost Gentiles here. He's speaking to the children of Israel in covenant relationship. And today he speaks to Christians in covenant relationship. God has a much higher accountability for his children than he does for lost people. Lost people make altars with steps. Lost people make all kinds of ornate things and stuff like this as they worship gods of their imagination and their idolaters and their idols. God says, you know, Paul says, God winks his eye at this. God winks his eye at the things lost people does because he only has one command from them, that they repent and turn to Jesus Christ for salvation. But when it comes to God's children, God doesn't wink his eye at his children when they do something that's contrary to the commanded, given, written word of God. And here he's telling them, don't you make an altar and go up in that direction. Because the problem is, when you make an altar, as you fashion your hands on it, and you work it, the problem is, you are now ascending. You are trying to approach unto me by your own works. God says, that's not the way you do it. You take an altar of earth. You take something I have made as it is and prepare it and put your, your burnt offerings on there. On. In other words, you don't fix up to come to me. You don't ascend unto me. You come as you are. And the altar of earth is right there on the ground. Why? Because the way to approach me is by getting down not by lifting up. That was tried in Genesis 11. You're not trying to ascend to heaven. I have to come down to you. And the only way I'll come down to you is when you get down on your face and call out to me and realize you need me to bridge the gap. Don't even try and bridge it by a few steps. All of your righteousness is a filthy rag to me. This is what God is trying to tell them. You make the altar of the earth that I prepared you bring the sacrifices that I gave to you because the cattle on a thousand hills are mine and you re realize you're giving back to me what I've already given you and you get down on your face and you worship that way. That's the right attitude before the high and lifted up one that inhabits eternity. And I would certainly hope his children understand that. I know I do. Idolaters and Gentiles who sacrifice to devils don't understand those things. And they actually think by making their ornate altars and their things that impress men and things that are highly esteemed in the sight of men, which is abomination in the sight of God, Luke 16, 15, they think they're ascending up to God. They're getting a little holy. They're getting a little closer with a Nicolaitan attitude. God says, that's not the way we do it. He says this. He says, verse 24, If you make an altar of earth, an altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and thou shalt sacrifice thereon burnt offerings and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen. Because we are separated. Which is something I showed all the way back in, in Genesis 3 and 4. God says, read the story of Adam and Eve. Read the story of Cain and Abel. Read the story of the sacrifice I accepted. There must be blood shed. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. And he says, he ends it by saying this, in all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee and bless thee. He says, let me give one more condition to, to the meeting and the blessing. It will only be in the places where I record my name. It's not of your choosing where you can meet with me. It's not of your choosing. So now what we're going to see in the next few chapters as we go forward, we're ending this chapter here, in the next few chapters as we go forward, God is going to begin to lay down for them ordinances and laws, civil and ceremonial laws, and they will have to heed and obey these commands or they will not meet with God nor be blessed by God. Let me show you in the Old Testament where this place was. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 8. 
First Kings chapter eight. First Kings chapter eight. I show you, you know, I just want to tell you something. And I deal with people all the time when it comes to a relationship with God. I was dealing with a guy last week. <laughs> My heart just utterly broke. This guy is completely bound up in a false religious system. As I sat and listened to this guy, it, it just, my heart wept. He goes on pilgrimages to foreign nations looking for God. It, it, it reminds me of the woman at the well. Is it this mountain or that country or this place where I'm going to find God? He's out of his dispensation. He's out of his testament. I'm going to show you the Old Testament. Then I'll show you the New Testament. But what I want to sh show you first and foremost is this. It, it's God that determines the, the way back to him. It's God. God has determined that there's one way back to him in the New Testament. Jesus said, I am the way. There's only one way. And, and the rebellious attitude of man is that I won't have that way. I want a second way. I want a third way. Why, why, not, why only one way? Why not three? Why not four? Why not ten? I'm going to tell you, if there were a hundred, you'd be mad that there weren't a hundred and one. That's the wicked heart of man. If there were a thousand, you'd be mad there weren't a thousand and one. It's the wickedness of the heart. You ought to thank God he's only made one way and made it simple so everyone can get it. So there's no confusion. Now in the Old Testament, he chose, he said, in the place where I record my name, there will I meet with you and there will I bless you. 1 Kings chapter 8. In 1 Kings chapter 8, one of the great chapters of the Bible, I, I very much look forward to teaching it. If you glance over it quickly, you see how many verses are in it. Look how many verses are in that chapter. 66. That's a picture of your Bible right there. You will find the major doctrines of the Bible right in this one chapter. You do a study on your own one day. You know what this chapter is about? It's about the building of the temple in Jerusalem. God commanded them to build that temple in Jerusalem and David wanted to do it and God commanded that Solomon would do it and here they are building and dedicating that particular temple and during the prayer when Solomon, verse 22, stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel, he spread forth his hands toward heaven and he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above or on earth beneath who keep his covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all thine heart. He goes, a beautiful prayer. It's just fantastic prayer. Verse 26, and now, O God of Israel, let thy word, I pray thee, be verified. Amen and amen. And then he says in verse 29, that thine eyes may be open toward this house night and day, even toward the place of which thou hast said, my name shall be there, that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. And God chose Jerusalem. God chose it. I've, I've read books by critics arguing that Jerusalem isn't the place that God chose. And we'll have to do a study on it one day because it's the most interesting fact. You know the word Jerusalem does not appear in the five books of Moses? That's one of the reasons they argue against it. It's a, it's a, great, it's a great type that God's setting up. It's a fabulous type that God's setting up. But, but God chose Jerusalem. But he didn't choose to tell Moses that it would be Jerusalem. He waited until Joshua came before he chose Jerusalem. But that was the place where God would meet with them and God would bless them. Until they got there, God would meet with them at the tabernacle that wandered in the wilderness. But then God chose Jerusalem. And God said, where I record my name is the place where I will bless thee. And in the Old Testament, it was the temple or the tabernacle. It ended up being Jerusalem is the place where the temple resided and the, the Shekinah glory of God dwelled. And if you wanted to know God, you had to go to Jerusalem. It was that simple. That was the Old Testament economy. Aren't you glad you were in the New Testament? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Now God comes to you. God's inverted the whole thing. But in the Old Testament, it was right there. And if you wanted to be blessed, you had to be like the Queen of Sheba. And you had to travel from your land. You had to be like the three wise men. You had to travel. You had to go where God was. And that was the only place you could meet God and the only place you could be blessed by God in the Old Testament. 
But in the New Testament, the economy has changed. And so now God says, where I record my name, I will come to thee and I will bless thee. Now, where would that be? Well, John chapter 1. Go to John chapter 1. The great thing about the God we have is he reveals these things to us. These things are written for us in a Bible. And Bibles are plentiful in the United States of America and all around the world. We were watching on the History Channel yesterday about uh, how the airline industries came about. And they really were started out with government subsidies back in the 1930s by major governments. Uh, there was the, the government in, in Holland. There was the government of Germany with Lufthansa. There was the government in the United States with Pan Am. And there was the government in uh, England, the UK. And I remember back then they said the, the sun never sets on the British Empire. And they were showing all the colonies Britain had. And the reason they would say that was they had colonies as far off as China and then working across the, the Mideast, and then they had colonies in Australia and Africa, and then of course they had uh, not many in Europe, but they had their homeland in Europe, and then they had colonies over in the West Indies and South America, and no matter where the sun, it never set on the British Empire, no matter where the sun was, it was always over a place where Britain had influence. Of course, the Bible you're reading is the King James Bible. And God chose to bring that Bible, that King James Bible, to a country that he knew would colonize the whole world. And Bibles would go out from there. This is the goodness of God. And then of course when the British Empire turned their back on Israel, God moved the next major empire to the United States. And it's the only time in transition of all of world history, study it yourself, where one major empire shifted to another major empire and they kept the same language, English. It's never happened in the history of mankind. Why is that? Because God knew the next major empire would also get the Bible out. He chose the language and he chose the empires. So his word would go out. So people could be blessed in the place where he requires his name, Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 33. And John bear record, and I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, that would be God, the same said unto me, upon whom Thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him. The same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Where's the place where you meet with God today? The place where he's recorded his name. Well, the record is born. It's in the Son of God. He's the one that has the Holy Ghost. Turn to Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. I will meet with thee in the place where I record my name. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it. The word sign is in the word signified. God's going to signify it by signs and wonders. Signified it by his angel unto his servant John. The apostle John's going to have all kinds of miraculous signs and wonders appear before him. And John bear record, here it is, of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. Where is the place where God has recorded his name? In the person of Jesus Christ. And where is the place where he's placed it? He's recorded it in the word of God. You want to meet with God? You want to be blessed with God? Well, we're no longer in the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament. You need to come to the Word of God and you need to meet Jesus Christ. And there God will meet with you and there God will bless you. I know I was with him a few hours this morning. I met with him in the Word of God. I was blessed. Saturday morning was amazing. <laughs> I met with him for a few hours and he opened all kinds of things up from the Bible. I was scrambling to write them down as quickly as I could so that we could teach them one day. And, and God will meet and bless you in his word in the New Testament. That's the place. That's the place. You don't need to engrave anything. You don't need to make an altar. You don't need to make an idol. All you need to do is come to the place that God hath chosen or he's chosen to record his name 
the Word of God, learn about Jesus Christ, God will meet you and God will bless you right there. It's good to be in the New Testament. Amen. We, we just Now that's the end of the 20th chapter. We're about to move on to the next division. As I'm writing on the board, if there's any questions that you've had on the Ten Commandments that maybe we can clear up, it took us a number of weeks, I'll be glad to field them. Amen. That's the Holy Ghost inside of us. Amen. The, the Lord comes to abide in us. We have a treasure on earth and vessels. Amen. Amen. Does it, I, I might have missed that, brother. That's good. Amen. That's so good. Don't you love the fellowship of the saints as we come up with things? I love that. It's great. Now, we're going to come up to these next three chapters, chapter 21, 22, and 23. And these three chapters are grouped together. What had just happened is if, if we retrospectively look, in chapter 20... The Lord gave forth the moral law. The moral law is God's law for his universe. Uh, you, you cannot break these laws. You say, well, sure I can. I can commit adultery. I can steal. I can kill. Yeah, you can break them for a while, but they're going to catch up with you. Okay? Again, like the guy jumping off the building. I mean, he's flying for a while. He's having a great time. A guy jumping out of an airplane. He's, he's defying the law of gravity, having a great time. Pretty soon, when he hits the pavement, he'll have concrete evidence that you can't break that law. Okay? That's what's going to happen to him. All right? That's what happens in God's universe with the moral laws. So he lays down the moral law. In, in chapters 21, this is Exodus, through 23, he's now going to move from the moral law to the civil law. When we get to the book of Leviticus, he will give to the priests, the Levites, the ceremonial law. The way it was kept within the nation of Israel, the scribes were responsible for keeping and writing the moral law. The elders were responsible for keeping and adjudicating the civil law. They would sit in the gate there. The elders, the chiefs of the uh, tribes, the, the heads of 10,000, the heads of thousands, they would be the elders. And the priests, both Levites, uh, the Kohanim, the uh, Gershomites, the Merarathites, the various priests, their job was the ceremonial law. So as we go through these next number of chapters and the next book, we're going to find God laying these laws down. But he began with the moral law. The moral law is absolute throughout his universe. The civil law and the ceremonial law is going to be specifically given to the nation of Israel in such a manner that the time will come when Jesus Christ will do away and blot out those ordinances, these here, civil and ceremonial. Jesus will not do away with the moral law. Jesus still expects Christians to uphold the moral law. Jesus does not expect Christians to run out and commit adultery. Jesus does not want Christians to run out and steal. He does not want Christians to run out and murder, obviously. He does not want Christians to go out and be idolaters. But he does not expect us to keep the civil or ceremonial law. When we read through this stuff, we're going to see that in no way, shape, or form does he expect us to keep this. He has done away with the civil and ceremonial law. The moral law is transcendent. The only moral law that we are not expected to keep is the Sabbath, literally, but spiritually we keep it because he is our Sabbath and we've entered into him. We've entered into the rest of Christ. So now we're going to be heading into chapter 21 and we'll be looking at the civil ordinances and the civil law given for the nation Israel while they're in the promised land, while God is there in the temple, God expects a nation to run a certain way. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, you will find him bringing back, reviving the civil and ceremonial law for his people because they got it wrong without him. And so he'll be their tutor to get it right during the millennial kingdom. But right now we're looking at it the first time as the Lord gives it to the nation Israel. They're going to fail without the Messiah. I don't know about you, but I failed without the Messiah. 
Okay. Uh, it's it's one of those things where you know I remember we had this one test uh, back in college where there was a lot of problems to be solved and so it was an open book test, okay, and without the book I, I never would have gotten through. Well, well, if the book is the word of God, we're not going to make it if we don't have an open book test. We need we need the word of God open, and someday we need the word of God with us. We need the author of our faith with us. The only way we can pass these tests. We're going to look at how Israel does as the Lord gives them the civil law. And of course, we already know ahead of time what's going to happen to them. So now we're going to begin. We'll look at the first paragraph in chapter 21, and we'll read through it, and then we'll comment. It's verses 1 through 6. The civil ordinances given to the nation Israel in covenant relationship with the Lord. Now, these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges, and he shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Okay, now the very, <laughs> the very first law that's given the very first civil ordinance given has to do with care for servants and, if you will, civil servants here. And this is the very first thing that's given to us. Now, I was reading through this, talking to my wife about this last night. Uh, we were looking through this together, trying to discern what are the uh, doctrinal, spiritual, and historical ramifications of these six verses. And thankfully, my wife gave me some insights. Let me just share with you the things we came up with here. First off, as I went through the scriptures, I, I searched out the word all and the word bore. And the word all is only found two times in the scriptures. It's found in this passage here, and it's also found in the repetitive uh, passage in Deuteronomy 15, which basically repeats this one we're looking at. So I wasn't getting a lot there. Then I looked at the word uh, bore, uh, which is to, to go through and to make a hole into something, and that's only found two times in the Bible too. It's found here, and it's also found in Job 41, where they talk about boring the jaw through with a thorn for Leviathan's judgment. So, so I, I was getting some things, but, but let, me just, let me just talk to you. Okay, first we'll talk historically. Historically, what the Lord is saying, historically, and then I'll show you the doctrinal and the spiritual application. Mm -hmm. Historically, here's what's happening. God is, is allowing, God understands, God is making an economy up for the Jewish people that is entrepreneurial and capitalistic because that's the way God thinks. God is a capitalist. God believes in labor. God believes in people receiving the rewards of their labor and the fruits of their labor and keeping it. And God understands that in a society, there is a bell curve. God is a realist. Amen. Amen. God is not a goofball liberal. As a matter of fact, God thinks liberals are vile. Book of Exodus, chapter 32. We've looked at that. Uh, God understands there is a bell curve. You understand what a bell curve is, right, folks? Do you, do you know how the bell curve works? The bell curve is a reality in life. Uh, this would be the, the abscissa, and this is the ordinate, I believe, correctly. So if you have a bell, if you take, let's say, example, the height of, uh, the height of people, and the height is on this side here. And this is the number of people. And so I got short people who are four, uh, four feet tall, and I got uh, big people who are eight feet tall. There aren't a lot of four-footers. There aren't a lot of eight-footers. But when I get into the middle around six foot, there seems to be a lot more people in this range here, lots of people as you number them up. And then by the time you finish it off, you get a curve that looks something like this. And most people fall in the middle, and very few people go on the ends. And no matter what you want to put here, if you want this to be IQ, and the IQ going from a low of 40 to a high of 200, you'll have something like that too. 
And this is, this is life. This is reality. Well, God also understands in terms of abilities. Turn back to uh, Exodus chapter, I believe it's 4. I just want to show you this. God understands it this way because God made it this way. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 11. And the Lord said unto him, speaking to Moses, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or the deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? He says, I understand there's blind people. I understand there's dumb people. Dumb in that they can't speak, and dumb in that they can't think that well. I understand there's smart people. I understand there's tall people and short people. I understand all these things because I make them that way. I make people that way. I like variety. I don't like robots. I don't like cookie cutter people. I don't like cookie cutter Christians. I like variety. It's the spice of life. I make trees different. I make people different. And I understand that when I make people different, there are going to be people with entrepreneurial capability that are going to amass a, a large estate like Job, the richest man in the East. And there are going to be poor people who don't seem to be very good at making money or handling money. And so what I'm going to allow, go back to where we were in Exodus chapter 21, I'm going to allow service contracts for Jewish males. That's what we're looking at here. This is a service contract for a Jewish male. He's saying, look, I've got a guy, he's an entrepreneur. His estate is growing. It's getting very large. He has much to manage and handle. And there are some young kids from the inner city that are Jewish that are poor. I'm going to give them an opportunity to have a service contract to work for that rich guy. That rich guy is going to have to buy that man. He's going to buy a six-year service contract from that man. He's a paid laborer in his house. No need to jump up and down. God approves slavery. He doesn't approve slavery. We're going to see later on that the, the, he has the death penalty for slavery. And we'll look at that when we get to those ordinances. Right now he's saying, I allow civil service contracts where a man can work inside of another man's home. But I only allow it for six years and no longer. This is an opportunity for a poor man to work under a rich man and to learn something. Turn to Leviticus, next book, chapter 25. Do we have any more water? Leviticus 25, next book. Picking it up around verse uh, 39. Leviticus 25, 39. And if thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor and be sold unto thee, okay, he was poor, he didn't have an opportunity for a job. You gave him some money. You're allowing him to work for you. Uh, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bond servant, but as an hired servant, as a sojourner. He shall be with thee and shall serve thee, either the six-year contract or until the year of the Jubilee. If the Jubilee comes first, then he departs, verse 41, and he shall depart from thee, both he and his children with him, and shall return to his own family. He's, he's going on to uh, verse... Uh, He's just showing, let's see, verse, they are my servants, verse 42, which I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as bondmen. I don't allow slavery and selling people. And not only that, verse 43, thou shalt not rule over him with rigor. I know that he's living in your house and you start to think you own him. You don't own him. He's mine. He works his 40 hours or whatever it is, whatever the work week is, and he has his time off. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, verse 43. Verse 53, and as a yearly hired servant shall he be with him, and the other shall not rule with rigor over him in thy sight. God's just showing there are conditions to this. I'm not permitting slavery in the nation of Israel, but I do allow service contracts. And this young poor guy may get an opportunity to learn something from the rich guy. You imagine the opportunity you would have. Think about this. If you were allowed to be hired by Bill Gates and to work with him for a number of years and, and, and to live in his house with him and to, to get some of the wisdom 
Think about some of the opportunities. They've got an opportunity to work with Steven Spielberg. These are the opportunity. I'm just showing the opportunities happening right here that God's permitting that someone is allowed to hire someone who's poorer and bring them into the house for a six-year service contract. This is not slavery. Now, this is what's happening historically. I wanted to show you historically what's happening because some people look at this and say, see, God, he allows uh, slavery. He doesn't allow slavery. He's allowing a service contract. But there are certain conditions that he has. Verse 3, if the man came in by himself, he goes out by himself. If he were married, if he came in with a wife, he goes out with the wife. Verse 4, but if the master has given him a wife, and she, now the master given him a wife, when I think about this, the master has given him a wife, I almost think it's one of the master's families. Someone of the, of the family. And she have borne him sons or daughters. The wife and her children shall be her masters. And he shall go out by himself. In other words, this is still my family. And this is where the servant has the opportunity to say, look, I love my master. I love my wife and my children. I will not go out free. And then he gets an opportunity to stay there. Historically, what happens is the master would bring them to the judges. The judges, the civil ordinances were the elders. The elders are the judges. And they go to the door, the doorpost, and then he'd bore his ear through with an awl and serve him forever. Now, what's happening here is when, when you, it, he's only boring one ear through. Now, this is a careful study I did in the scriptures. When you study through the scriptures, you will find the difference between a single earring and two earrings. The single earring is found in three places in the Bible. Single earring is spoken of a, an earring of gold. It's found in Genesis 24. When, when uh, Isaac gets his wife, Rebecca, it's found in Job 42, where, where Job is then rewarded at the very end and given the single earring of gold. And it's found in Proverbs 25. Turn to Proverbs 25. Only three times in the scriptures is it's found. And it's found in a positive light. Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25, verse 12, as an earring, single earring of gold, and an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover upon an obedient ear. Single ear. This is the picture here. This is the picture. Now, when Jesus spoke in the book of Revelation seven times, he says, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the churches." Something like that. I have to read it myself. Uh, it's single. I know I was reading it last night. Seven times he says it very carefully. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that hath an ear. Not ears, but a single ear. And this is the picture of the ornament of fine gold, the wise reprover Jesus upon an obedient ear. This is a picture of a servant that's given himself to his master and he says, my I've given him my ear. This is the one I follow. This is the one I listen to. This is the one I follow. Now, I think maybe what happened here is the, 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 he bored a hole in, and I think an earring of gold, a single earring of gold was placed there, kind of represent that that servant, wherever he went, would represent that he was now part of that household. He was now a member of that household. He was no longer, when's your contract up? See this? My contract's never up. I'm part of that household for good. I've moved in. So historically, that's what's happening now. Now, doctrinally, to show you the doctrinal application, turn to Galatians chapter 3. Because the doctrinal is the most important application. And then I'll show you a spiritual that applies to you and me. But the doctrinal one will set the spiritual. We only have six minutes. He says we're not going to get to it. All right. All right. So we'll have to do the doctrinal picture next week. We're out of time. Okay, so that's the historical picture of what was going on. As, as a matter of fact, um, let me see the one last thing. I, I had a, another uh, thing in the Proverbs, and I must not have written it down. Uh, it's Proverbs 29. Proverbs uh, 29. Um, I'll have good luck if I find it. <laughs> Verse 21. 
Here's the picture of, of the man serving in this uh, household, serving his master there. And it says this, verse 21, He that delicately bringeth up his servant from a child shall have him become his son at the length. The picture given there is this relationship of, of, of being a servant inside of a house was one that would actually bond the hearts together, bond the, the ear of the young one to the wisdom of the older one. Their hearts would be melded together and the older one had the responsibility of bringing this servant along delicately and this would become like a son to him over time. So, so instead of this being a picture of any kind of slavery, this is a love relationship where God has allowed a way of the poor people to be taken care of by the wealthy people in, in the nation, bringing them right into the home, paying them for their service, and yet lovingly and delicately bringing them up and making sons of them. That's the picture historically going on. I'll show you the doctrinal and spiritual applications next week. Any other questions on what we had? Let's pray. Father, thank you um, for the preciousness of your word and, and these laws that are written that are given for our admonition as an example to us and, and help us, Lord. Uh, we understand, Lord, that you're a lover of men and a lover of souls. And, and you would never tolerate anything such as slavery. And the servant relationship one was a precious one, Lord, with, with a loving master that feared God and, and brought up these servants properly. Help us, Lord, as parents to bring up our children in like manner and help us at the workplace if we have any under us to treat them in such a manner, Lord. Help us to be wise reprovers on their ear and help us to knit hearts with co-workers, Lord, and bring them to Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.